we have Hendrik Nyberg, who is a chief scientist and co-founder of Hops.com. And Henrik's focus is on the practical application of generative AI in product development and other areas. His background includes working at the likes of Spotify, Lego. He's even uh, contributed to Minecraft as well, which my son was super, super interested in. So I'm going to be quizzing him about that. So welcome, Henrik Nyberg, to the Visual Jam today. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Oh, you're welcome, Henrik. So the format of today, we're going to do a, a bit of an interview, getting to know Henrik at the beginning, and then I'll be passing over to Grant, who's going to then quiz Henrik on some of the great work he does, especially around his visual work. And then we'll bring in a lot more of the audience participation from there on. What is your superpower that you bring to the world? Oh, superpower. I think what other people say is my superpower is the ability to take complicated things and explain it in a simple way. So I'm going to go with that. Nice, nice. And I think a lot of people on the call today are probably also hoping that they can build that superpower, especially the visual thinkers amongst us. In terms of your background, Henrik, take me back to a 10-year-old Henrik. What was he like and what dreams and aspirations did he have? 10-year-old Henrik lived in Tokyo, liked to ride his bike around. I'm not sure if I'd gotten his computers yet by then, but maybe. I was pretty early into hacking computers and having a lot of fun. Well, not hacking, but tinkering with computers and banging on the piano sometimes. That was, that was pretty much me. Wow. And you mentioned Tokyo, did you say? Yeah, I grew up there. I lived 16 years as a kid in Tokyo before moving to here, Sweden. Wow. Tell us a little bit about Tokyo, because I have a friend over there and just Japan generally, like the culture is very different to many other Oh people. yeah, Liv living in, I mostly, I was in Japan during the, most of the year and then Sweden during the summers. So these cultures are very different. So it was quite interesting. But yeah, Tokyo, big city, noisy, but clean for being a big city, very little crime rate, friendly people and very chaotic. Nice, nice. <laughs> and the education system is very different as well, I believe. It's very different, but I didn't attend Japanese schools. I attended an American school in Japan. So I don't, I have done run a firsthand experience of the Japanese education system. And what did you want to be when you grew up? Like, I'm guessing it was something to do with computers because you were tinkering. With I like tinkering with computers, but originally I was planning to be a musician, actually. So I like tinkering with instruments as well. I'm, I'm in my home studio. It's, <laughs> I'm surrounded by instruments here. <laughs> oh, wow. You got a whole band there. Yeah. yeah. But at some point I decided that I want to play music for fun. I don't want to have to the pressure of making an income out of it. So then I decided that maybe computers and programming could be my source of income and then I could play music just for fun. So that's what I do. <laughs> I love that. And is that important for you to have that balance between having a sort of a, the, the arts and some of the more kind of hardcore work that you do? Definitely. Like, like way, my brain never stops thinking about stuff and it drives me crazy. So the only way to get my brain to shut up is to get it occupied with something. So if I'm playing piano or something, then I'm, I'm being mindful and present. So that's great. I need that escape. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about your career then from then on in. So when you moved to Sweden, like what, what happened then in terms of your job situation? So I came to Sweden, went to boarding school, and then, like I said, decided to not be a musician and instead to become a programmer. So I studied at uh, your Royal Institute of Technology here in Stockholm, basically computer science. And this was during the dot-com boom. So a lot of companies were starting up and I got dragged into that whole whirlwind. So I went from being a programmer and a consultant to being an entrepreneur. And as some of the companies I was involved with grew, then I stumbled into being a manager. And that's how I learned about, about product development from a bunch of different perspectives by basically being pushed off a cliff a few times. <laughs> got it. And was your one of your first major roles, was that at Spotify? I was involved in a few pretty much unknown startups during that period. And then as I learned, I started sharing knowledge through articles and videos. And then Spotify was just one of the clients that I ended up with, but it was a company that I stayed with a long time and I was there quite early. So it was a very interesting journey. But my kind of career as coaching, which is what I've been doing for a long, a big part of my career, started a lot earlier than Spotify. It's just that I think Spotify is what pe most people know about since I made a video about what, what, what was going on there. Yeah, and about 5 million people on the planet have watched it. So yeah, I'm <laughs> sure we, we all know about that. And we'll post some links to those videos in a short while so people who haven't come across your work can check it out. I'm really interested to know some of your experiences at Spotify because I think a lot of us, we hear all of these amazing stories about how 
we should be using the Spotify model when we're trying to implement ways of working such as Agile. Could you tell us a bit more about the early days of Spotify? Like, was it literally like a handful of people sat in a room? Pretty much your standard startup. A bunch of Swedes at, at my university got together and decided to revolutionize the music industry, being the naive idiots that all entrepreneurs have to be, otherwise no companies get started. So everyone said, that's a stupid idea. You can't change the whole music industry. So they went ahead and just did it anyway, which is cool. And I was lucky to get involved pretty early. And what was interesting to me was that it, the company was born into Agile from the beginning. I never had to convince anyone. I never had to transform the company. They had an Agile mindset pretty much from the get-go. And I was happy to have a chance to contribute to that. So my job there was just to help us figure out how to scale with this as we grew. And how do we manage now that we got multiple teams or even hundreds of, of teams? But yeah, to be clear, I've never told anyone anywhere that they should be using the Spotify model. Yeah, I've seen a few blogs about that where people have tried to dissuade people from using it and, and they still go ahead and, and well, do I, it. I wouldn't say that either. I, right. I just say, do whatever works for you. And Spotify is one example of one company. So if some of the stuff we were doing inspires you, then steal that. Take the best bits and then adapt it to your context. <laughs> that, that's what we were doing at, at Spotify. Great. I'm just looking at the chat as well. So I'll crowdsource a few questions as we go along. And Pedro yeah. was asking, what kind of company is Spotify to work for? Like, what's the culture like there? So I haven't been there for like six years. I have friends that are still there, but I can only speak to when I was there. And I thought it was amazing. Really one of the most cool and fun cultures I've ever worked at. It was, it was just interesting. And that's why I decided to write about it because there was something interesting going on there. I'm not exactly sure how it came to be, but it was definitely a, a different culture. Some of it maybe was a changed and a little bit lost as it grew, which often happens with companies as they get big. But uh, yeah, I thought it was quite, quite a really interesting company. And thinking about times back then, you had Apple who had the, their kind of Apple store and, the, and, the, and all the kind of the music side of things. How did they compete with these big players in the market? And what was their secret to that? In, in the beginning, it was very simple. They didn't need to compete because everyone thought Spotify were idiots doing something that, that shouldn't be done. It can't be done. So nobody was bothering to compete with Spotify because they're obviously going to fail. But then after a while, suddenly it turned out that actually Spotify's idea of having people stream music instead of owning music and consuming music online instead of buying CDs, that crazy idea turned out actually to be a good idea and people loved it and it became huge. So then the competitors woke up, Google and Apple and all these companies and started chasing after Spotify. So then, of course, that created a bit of a panic. And everyone was at Spotify. I was like, oh, ah, I don't know. we got to be faster than ever. But I would say a lot of it boiled down to Spotify at the time had less money, less people, less resources, less everything than their competitors. But the one thing they had was an incredibly strong culture and a very, and a culture optimized for speed of innovation and speed of iteration, which meant they could pretty much out agile their competitors. And I think that's really what helped them win. And would you say that was due to the structures they had in place or the, the fluid structures or, or what is that secret source? Because I, I hear other organizations constantly trying to bring that agility into their organization. The first thing they go for are working practices. Yeah, I think it's like some people think that Spotify became agile because of the structure, but I think it's more like the opposite. The structure was created because they wanted to be agile. Uh, so the, the, mindset of the management, especially the, 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 te the technical leaders, was really, we need to be really fast. We need to move fast and turn fast and learn faster than our competitors because that's the only edge we have. So by optimizing for that, then everything else followed. So in order to move fast, teams need to be able to make decisions on their own and not wait for, for management. Okay, what do we need to have in place for that to happen? In order to release often, we need to automate everything. So what do we need, need to do to make that happen? So everything followed from that main goal of we need to be really fast. And then in stark contrast, Lego, who were a much larger. <laughs> yeah. Could, they, could you tell us a bit about Lego? Like, what was that uh, transition like for you when you went there? What was the lay of land there? Because I know Lego went through the big dip at one point. Yeah. Went out of business. I, 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 that was before my time, but they, they had a crisis and came out of it and learned a lot and became stronger from it. When I came to Lego, they were really open to change. They had noticed, they had seen that Spotify stuff that I wrote about, and they realized that they need to change the way they work to move a lot faster. The world is moving too fast. So although Lego was really good at things like waterfall model and traditional processes, they've really ironed that out. They realized that being good at that is not enough anymore in this faster moving world. So I was very surprised how this big old company was open to trying new ideas. That was fun. But personally, it was fun for me because I mostly work within software companies. But at Lego is not a software company, right? <laughs> so software is just, it's just an enabler for them. 
So it was really fun to come to come to a company and learn a lot about how do they actually make molds and how do they make these boxes and how do they run the factory and how can we apply some thinking to other parts of Lego, such as their design process. So that was I, I learned a lot from that. What were some of the biggest learnings from that design process? Because I'm sure we could learn a lot from that as well. I think something that I already knew, but that became even stronger was when I noticed how incredibly good they were at uh, involving the user um, continuously. Mm -hmm. In this case, kids. So trying out models really early. Like even designers with 50 years of experience, like half a decade of experience, had the, the, the humility to realize that they don't have all the answers. I need to be testing my models all the time with real users. So that was a big aha for me to see that kind of ingrained in the culture. And I have to ask you this next question because of my son who's 12 and he absolutely loved playing Minecraft. When we spoke to you pre the event, you mentioned you'd actually built some features within the Minecraft game. Like, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I, I probably, well, I worked as a designer and, and a developer. So of course I didn't build anything alone, but I had a pretty core role in probably about 10 or 15 different features in, in the game. I guess maybe one of the, some of the most visible ones is the terrain generation. We completely changed it. We made completely new types of caves and new mountains. And I spent about a year working on just about only that. So very fun stuff. But my, my first feature in Minecraft was actually the villager children. So there's little kids in Minecraft. They didn't do anything. So I, I made them play. So if you, if you see little children chasing each other and jumping on the bed and stuff, then that, that was my, my, my first one. <laughs> oh, wow. I'll have to look out for that. I'll get my son afterwards <laughs> to give me a, a quick demo. Uh, and Henrik, I know we don't have a a lot of time for this snippet, but I'd be really interested to know your perspective on the future of generally tech and product development, and also about some of the AI stuff you're doing at the moment, because I, I believe that's now that next phase of, of your journey. Yeah, I, I did a pretty quick pivot about a year ago when I realized that, my God, this AI thing is changing everything, and I got fascinated by it. So since then, I've worked pretty much full-time exploring how to apply this technology but also consulting with companies and I'm involved in several startups and basically just dove in. And I think that's pretty much what the future of tech is. It really is about um, embracing AI and using AI as your colleague in your day-to-day -day work. And what does that mean in practice? So that's what's being the, what everyone is trying to discover right now. And the exciting projects that you're working on at the moment, could you give us a bit more detail about that? Yeah, I guess most recently, me and some friends were involved in a Swedish TV documentary um, about generative AI. And our part of that was about AI agents. And an AI agent is essentially a coworker, a digital coworker that works autonomously, it doesn't just sit around and wait for you to prompt it, but it has a mission and it has tools and it works alongside you, autonomous. So we built basically a digital journalist to work alongside a human journalist. And they collaborate on a trailer board and, and create content. And it's just, it's been really fun. So uh, I, re I recently put up a little demo video on our fleeting.ai site, which I guess I can put a link to. But yeah, so I guess my focus in, like within the AI field is really about building autonomous agents or, or digital coworkers. That just sounds super futuristic. So excited to, to know more about and that. And I guess a key part of that is, is my big aha has been that AI is amazing, but AI plus human, that's where the magic lies, when humans work together with AI. So that's the space that I'm trying to zoom in on. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I'm glad you finished off on that note, because I, I think that gives us all a sense of relief, which is, which yeah. is great that we're still needed. I think we're still needed. <laughs> for how long? I don't know. But, <laughs> but, but for now. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Henrik, for that. I'm going to now pass over to my good friend, Grant, and he's going to take the next part of the session. Over to you, Grant. Thanks, Paddy. Well, I've been really interested to to hear your background and, and what an amazing journey you've been on, Henrik. But I think the bit that caused me to get in touch with you and chance my arm at seeing if you'd join us on the Visual Jam was, was really how you can't pay attention by using visuals to explain things. You talked about the Spotify model, and I remember seeing a video you did, Agile Product Ownership in a Nutshell, which really simplify the explanation of how Agile works from a product owner perspective. From my, I've shared that so many times with people to just say, well, if you want to know what product ownership is, just go and watch that and then we'll have a conversation. So that's the bit that I wanted to dive a bit deeper into in, in this session, really. So I wondered if you could maybe share with us some of the examples that you've produced in, in the past and maybe let the, the audience see some of the, the types of visuals that I'm talking about. Well, here are some examples that I think Grant and Patty put up just now. And I don't know what I should 
say about them. I have some links below to where I mean, they I'd came from. I'd just be interested but... to maybe just talk us through a couple of them, Henrik, yeah. and explain why sure. you use the visual. Why did you find the need to create a visual, for example, on explaining MVPs? Right. So people are wired differently. The way I'm wired is I, I cannot think without drawing, essentially. So if I'm trying to explain something to myself or to someone else, I need a whiteboard or a piece of paper and I need to draw. And only then does it become clear in my head. Um, so this is just the result of that. And I think these pictures are prettier than, these are not representative because normally when I'm drawing, it looks more like, I'll, uh, I have a draw, draw, drawing tablet here. It's more like, like that. And like, there's the car. It's super ugly. It's really simple because I'm just trying to convey something and I have to draw while thinking about it. So after a typical session with me, you'll have a whiteboard that's just a, a mess that no one can understand except the people who are there. These pictures are a little polished up because I wrote an article. Yeah. And talk us through that, that one in the middle there, you've got a little man teetering on a pile of rocks. This so you're, one. You're using, yeah. Yeah. So, so the Spotify engineering culture video, let me dig that up. Just show the whole picture. Spotify engineering culture. It's actually two videos, but it's a live drawing video. And all my videos are, tend to be uh, live drawn like, like this. Whatever they want. And then at the end, it ends up being this big picture, which I think, yeah. So what I basically did there is for every little part that I wanted to explain, I wanted to have some visual way of doing it. And here I, I, I wanted to explain what I thought was quite fascinating at Spotify, which was this culture of finding a minimum viable bureaucracy. Like we need some structure, but we want, want as little structure as possible because structure can get, can get in the way. But with too little structure, we just get chaos. So I was trying to think of how do I visualize that? And then I thought of, okay, we're balancing between two things. So I think my first draft was pretty much like a, maybe just a scale like that, like that. And then here's chaos and here's bureaucracy. I was like, okay, this is boring. Can I make it more fun? And I was like, what is the consequence of chaos? What is the consequence of bureaucracy? And I thought of if it's too bureaucratic, you get stuck. It's painful and you can't move and you're stuck. So I just envisioned falling down into these spikes. I know it's morbid, but. And then with chaos, you're just running around fighting fires everywhere. So I figured I might as well, and that's painful in, in, in another way. So that's how I ended up doing that. And then I, this, the original version of this was actually for a talk in Paris. So I drew the Eiffel Tower in the first version here for that talk. Okay. But then later on, when I made the Spotify version, I was like, it'd be weird. What, why is the Eiffel Tower here? So I figured, why not a pile of rocks? Because that shows the kind of how it's not entirely stable, this balance, and it could fall apart. And I also thought carefully about the fact that in the video, I mentioned that we prefer chaos over bureaucracy. So we'll never find a perfect balance. But if I have to pick, I'd rather be a little bit too far this way. That's why I drew this guy tilting a little bit to the left here. And then I, th and I looked at the picture after a while. I'm like, what is helping us figure this out? And I thought, well, this is really a cultural thing that nobody talks about this, but it's assumed that we want to find a balance and we definitely don't want to be here and we'd rather be a little bit more here. And that's what the culture is. So then I just added this bit, bit down here. So yeah, that's the story behind that picture. Wow, that's cool. Oh yeah, this is interesting. When I came to Spotify, it was a dinky little startup. And the small little startups are just chaotic. But then as they grew, they needed to add a little more structure. So I drew the Spotify icon and said, here they are on the journey towards the right. When it came to Lego, it's kind of the opposite. They had all this bureaucracy, yeah. all this structure, we need, which we need to remove and simplify. So they were too far to the right and moved, moving to the left. So I added those. <laughs> it's really interesting how such a simple visual, though, packs so much mm. into it. And you can tell a whole story around that one visual. And we all intuitively get it, right? Yeah. The other example you've got to the far right there is probably the bit you just start to talk about towards the end of that discussion with Paddy, the idea of embedding AI into work. Do you want to explain this one? Because I like this because it's really simple. Which seems... Yeah. Yeah. I wrote an article just last week on the theme of like, since I've worked a lot within the Agile space and now I focus on AI, then the question is, what's the impact? How does Agile change? And I think it changes quite a lot. So I wrote an article with that. And as usual, I need pictures about every paragraph. Otherwise, I can't even sort things out in my own head. These are really simple. This is more representative. These are the kind of ugly drawings I normally draw. Very simple. Just to capture this. So this is the Venn diagram of knowledge, a cross-functional team with people and overlapping knowledge. And here comes AI with massive knowledge, but it doesn't replace all human knowledge. So, and what I wanted to add there was my prediction. And I hate predicting things because they're always wrong, of course, especially with AI. But I still felt the need to share some observations. And the observation seems to be that teams are getting smaller because when, you're a, when you have an AI-empowered team, you don't necessarily need all these different cross-functional skills because AI just has this incredibly huge skill base. So the pattern I'm seeing is that teams are getting smaller, but then more numerous. So I wanted to capture that in one picture. So I was like, okay, here's a couple of typical agile cross-functional teams that are typically five or six people. And maybe we're moving towards a world where there's smaller teams and each one has an AI buddy. 
and then we probably have more of those teams. So that's what I wanted to ca capture there. Cool. I mean, I think on the board as well, we've actually got a couple of the example videos. I think that the latest one you've done is, is on generative AI. This one, yeah. Yeah. So talk us through, because I love this one and, and I love the kind of metaphor you used of having kind of Einstein in your basement. That really yeah. just jumps out and gets the point across really simply in a way that most people will just intuitively get and understand. But talk us through the process of how you went about crafting this. Did you just start doodling? Did you have a script beforehand? How did you go about doing this one? So first of all, I can mention a funny thing about this thing. We have this figure, Einstein. The video, again, is the process of me drawing this picture. So I used a pen to point to things, but also to draw things. I sometimes paste in pictures and then a lot of live drawing. So a funny thing about Einstein. So I've noticed that I unconsciously try to have a, a character in my videos whenever possible. And I only learned recently that's part of what makes the videos engaging. So in my first one with product ownership in a nutshell, here's the first thing I say. My first sentence is, here's Pat. She's a product owner. Let's yeah. explain things from her perspective. And I'm always referring back to her perspective. And she's the protagonist here. And here it's by accident, I think, I had this Einstein figure who starts over here. It's stuck in the basement. Later on, he gets to take a walk with you. And later on, he actually gets to be free and go out and walk on his own with a mission and his own tools. And uh, I think, yeah, having a sort of kind of protagonist helps. But yeah, the story behind this video. So this reflects, it's funny because I get this question a lot. It's so funny. If you look at this video, if you look at the comments of the video, it's incredible. Like every, I would say, uh, I do read comments and about every second comment is how the hell did you make the video? So everyone is curious about how the hell, so what's the process? So I'm glad to finally get a little bit of time to explain. <laughs> but I haven't gotten around to it. So what is the process? So basically, at a high level, I start with a PowerPoint, and that's going to be a that's going to sound very boring. But I start with a PowerPoint, and just think a little bit about what what do I want to get across. So I'm like, there's so many videos explaining Gen AI. Why would I make a video at all? I had to explain it. I had to convince myself to make a video. I was skeptical, but I decided that okay, I've learned a lot, and I want to get out get it out of my head. Maybe I can paint the big picture. So I was like, okay, hand drawn is more fun to watch. Ends with a picture that looks attractive. This was my little pitch just for myself. Like, why am I going to go off to my summer cottage and spend a week just zooming in on this, right? So I managed to convince myself that's a good idea. And this was my own little pitch. And then I, st then each, I started dividing it into chapters. Like a chapter to me is like a, a 10, 10 or 20 second part of the video. And by the way, stop if I get too detailed here. I don't know what level I should put this at. <laughs> but essentially, I figure out what are the main chapters. And I just start with the title of each one. And it's iterative. So I, I don't get it right in the beginning. I go back and I change it over and over again. And I, sp I spent about a couple of days obsessing over the script because one thing I've learned is that a video shouldn't be long. And with my product ownership video, it's a 15 minute video that corresponds to about two days of training. So I got to condense it to an insane level, which means every word matters. So when I start looking at what am I going to say here, I write something and then I change it and I change it and I change it like so many times until it's as short as it possibly can be. And then I count the words. And I stick it, in, stick it into a, a very primitive spreadsheet called timings. And I just write, how many words was it? I, I, I use a tool to count it. I don't count it by hand, but I stick in how many words because I've learned historically how many, how many words I speak per second. 2.8 words per second. If I speak faster than that, I lose everyone. So that's really too fast even then. But so I, basically this gives me a budget. The video should ideally be 15 minutes at most. So I have a budget of 2,525 words. And I'm going to do my best to keep the video to that length. So that's my constraint that I try to enforce on myself. And then I also, for each little section, I start thinking about what's going to be my visual. So here's an ugly draft. I want to, I'm talking about computers can now think. In the past, they just executed scripts. So maybe I can use a metaphor for that, a calculator. It just executes instructions. So maybe I have a calculator here and a bit of code. So I just put a little draft drawing. Here's another example of Venn diagram of how different AI technologies fit together. Just quickly draw something ugly here. Sometimes I copy paste stuff from a slide. Here, this was from a slide that I, I used in some presentation. So what am I going to say? What am I going to draw roughly? And then I obsess over this for a couple of days, back and forth. And for this video, I actually used GPT to help me. So GPT, I pasted in this stuff, gave it to GPT-4, and asked it to help me match this goal. I want it to be a broad audience. I want to reach both people who are new, and I also want to be able to reach people that are experienced. So I should use simple metaphors, but not too simple, and et cetera. So GPT was very helpful for, for, to find the right balance and it found some factual errors. It suggested some metaphors. It's a lot more useful than people realize. And, and once I'm 
done with this, then I basically record. For some of my videos, I have my face in the corner. For some, I don't. Now I'm leaning towards that people like seeing a little face in the corner like that. It feels more human. So I, I tend to do that. So microphone and the camera. Then I, I start editing it. I make it shorter. I cut out like empty spots. Like, oh, there is a bit of empty spot. There was a, there was a burp. There was a hiccup. There was me scratching my nose. Just go in and I just shorten it. Just remove stuff. Make it as short as possible. And I listen to it. And I basically do the whole thing in one take with small stops. Because if I do too many different takes, it sounds weird. The, the voice gets weird. But anyway, once I have the voice in, that becomes the skeleton. And then I draw. And drawing is a lot more slow. I use a program called ArtRage. It's just the first program that I happened to come across. I like it because it just, it's, just a, it's just a pen. It's a paintbrush and there's a pen here. And I use a drawing tablet. In this case, just a Wacom drawing tablet. You can use any kind of drawing tablet, really. Because drawing with a mouse is, is really a pain. <laughs> so uh, then I have my script typically on, on, on another screen. And I have this here because I want to know what, what I was supposed to draw roughly. But this is where I iterate on what's going to go where in the picture, right? So I need to have that figured out in advance. Is this going to go over here? Does that fit over here? Is this going to refer to that one? So I do a lot of iterating on this, moving things around until I'm happy with it. Then I start recording. So let's say I've done that. I've iterated. I know what, roughly what I'm going to draw. And we go back to uh, ScreenFlow. And we go, I want to record again. And this time I don't want to record talking. I want to record my screen. I do a lot of retakes when I mess things up. And I'm trying to make it not too pretty because it'll just take forever and it's not important for the message. And I'll be cutting sections and stuff like that and zooming in and stuff. So that plus two hours of me fiddling around with this drawing part to make the drawing fit in time with the speaking. That's it. It's a pain. It takes a long time. But, it, but the results are nice. Yeah, the results are great. There's a few people asking about the, the tool and are you using a tablet right now? So you're using a, is it a Wacom tablet you're using? Wacom and a pen. There you go. I've, I've tried using various iPad apps, but the combination of being able to draw and record and edit, it just, iPad just doesn't work. I need to have a, a computer with a proper program and a proper recording program like ScreenFlow. So for a while, I tried to move, switch tools. I'm like, this is not modern. Using a drawing tablet and a computer, that's like so 2000. I'm going to get an iPad and be one of the cool kids. But no, I went back. This works a lot better. So just fiddling around. But it, it takes about, when I'm at this step, drawing and recording, I'll calculate it to my dismay that it took about two hours per one minute of video. And that the whole video took me about 60 hours in total, including everything. So it, people sometimes get surprised because they think it looks effortless, like I'm just standing there talking and moving the pen. But every damn thing is a mini project. Even like, oh, I talked about X and I want to move the pen to point to that while I talk about it. Okay, back to screen flow, record me moving my pen from that part to that part, put it back in, edit it. So everything, it's a bloody pain. And I'm sure there's going to be better ways to do this in the future. But right now, this is what I got. Why like you said though, the result speaks for itself, almost a million views on that video and, and genuinely it, it brings to life the explanation. I think the fact it's interesting seeing that you did the script, but you've thought about the narrative the, and the yeah. story. We had Lee Lefever, who was the author of the art of explanation as a guest on the visual jam a while back. He produces expl explainer videos in a similar vein and. He does exactly the same thing. He starts with the script. He he's yeah. calculates how many words, how long a word will take, all the things you were describing. He pretty much does the same yeah. things. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think the key thing there is like, I, I could improvise this talk. I do it quite often. I do live talks, but then it takes me an hour. So, so, so scripting every word is necessary when you want something to be really short. Then you need yeah. to think about every word. You can't improvise it anymore. Absolutely. Okay. So Paddy, are there any other questions in the chat? Good question. Sorry, you caught me off guard there. Let me see. I would say if folks just put up their hands, we can do a bit of a Q&A because I'll probably miss some questions. So if you want to raise your hand. Yeah. So is that Leah? Who's that? What makes the videos viral? What makes the videos viral? viral. That, that's the title of this talk. Maybe yeah. I, I, I would love to hear your, I, I have no idea. Uh, honestly, well, I, I have ideas, but I'm sure you, you too. I, I'm no authority on that, really. What do you think? <laughs> what makes the video viral? I'm asking you. I <laughs> think it was your title. Okay, um, you posted this on YouTube. Yeah. If you look at the number of views. Would that tell us? Yeah, th this one is my first one. What surprises yeah. me is it's quite old now, and yet it's still like growing like incredibly fast. Oh, wait, Agile P in a nutshell. Just the Google ranking, right? And then it's up to, I made it 2012 yep. and it's up to 4.2 million views and it just keeps growing. Oh, wow. so, and then the, the one I just added, this one I just added a month ago and it's already up, up to a million almost or two months okay. ago. 
Why do you think it's become viral? I have, I have some theories. Because every one of these animated videos did become viral to different extents. And I made a lot of other types of things, articles and stuff that have not become as viral. So something about this format appeals to people. So I think mm. it's a combination of the fact that I don't make them very often, but when I make them, it's a topic I've thought about a lot. So content-wise, I think it's quite well thought out. And it's also content that I've had, a, had time to iterate on. Like I've been teaching people stuff, running courses, doing talks. So by the time I make the video, I already have a clear message and a clear way of explaining it. So that pre-work, I think, is an oh, important part of it. Because I, I can have the exact same format, but if the content isn't that good, I don't think the format will help. It won't cover up for that. The second thing I think is something about drawing. Physical, because I had some other videos where I got lazy. I just did like PowerPoint slides with animations. But content-wise, I would say the quality would, would be similar, but in no, nowhere near the same level of, of, uh, of uh, popularity. So I think there's something about seeing a pen and that pen is pointing to things and it's, and it's drawing while speaking. Maybe that just appeals to, to human nature somehow. Um, those are some of my theories. No, that's brilliant. Thank you. And just for the record, folks, it was our idea to call the session How to Make Your Video Go Viral. Not Hendrix. So just to put that out there. But the fact is, yeah, as you can see, millions of views. So people absolutely love those videos. And myself, coming from a agile training background, first thing I do on a product owner course is put that video on. It, it's a great way to set the scene. And, and I don't even have to say anything, to be honest. I, I, I actually do the same when I teach agile courses. I say, watch this video first. That gets the main content out of the way. And then we can just spend the rest of the course zooming in on the details. So it saves time. Uh, so thank you, Henrik. You made my life so much easier. I can go <laughs> for a coffee break. <laughs> Brilliant. Next in line, I think is Adam. Adam, would you like to come off mute? Sure. Yep. Yeah. Thanks so much, Henrik, for coming and speaking to us and showcasing that. That was brilliant. And I just want to say that when I pivoted into product, I was frustrated at the lack of decent explanation for what a what the sort of operational process of a product manager was. And your video yeah. was the thing that really solidified it. And I think it's because probably similar to you, I think in visual metaphor and I, and to me, that's what is so appealing to your videos is it's like having a conversation, a visual conversation with someone else, like in real time. It's not just like a meme, but it's like an interactive meme if that yeah. makes sense or resonates. But my question to you is um, really just, was there a moment in your life where you discovered like, Hey, this drawing thing is really like, it really helps me focus my own thoughts and my own thinking. Was it something that you learned in like a particular experience or was it like a work thing or something that you learned in school? I'm just curious, like what, like where that came from or where that started. Right. Yeah. Like I, I dug up my old uh, high school notebooks just for fun from the attic that, like a few years ago, just stumbled over them by accident. And I found my notebooks and I saw like, oh, this is apparently a, a notebook from a math lesson. And I see like, a tiny bit of math in the corner and the rest is just doodles. Typically me drawing caricatures of the teacher. So I think that kind of just became a, a bit of an obsession of just drawing. But then when the connection to work came, I guess later, I, I did a lot of role playing during high school and then I, I liked to draw stuff. It, it, it helped shape the campaign and help generate a good atmosphere when you had a drawing of something. But I'm not an artist. I don't, I don't make these beautiful pictures. It's quite simple. And again, the pictures on the board are not, I'm not this good at drawing. These are like, these are the, the prettified version. I, I'm, I'm really not an artist. This is more representative of my style, right? Simple stick figures. When I started getting into work life, I think I, no, I gradually noticed that when I get up in front of a whiteboard to visualize what I'm thinking right now or visualize what the room is talking about, I did it for my own sake. But I noticed that others, it, it made the whole room more aligned. People just seemed to get more smarter and more engaged when they had something to look at. So that way it just dawned on me that, hey, this is a useful thing, not only for me, but for everyone else as well. Great. Thanks. In fact, I, I can add to that. I found, you know what? Let me just quickly dig up that picture. It's quite funny. I found uh, the original article. Let's see. I'm not there. Yeah. I found this picture. This is from a, a workshop at Spotify that I did. I was introducing people to what product ownership is. And I kept iterating on how to explain that in a good way. And I finally stumbled over a way to visualize it using a circle and the P on the middle and then stakeholders over here and communication here. And I started using that. And I noticed that people got a lot more engaged by that picture. And then someone in the workshop suggested that, hey, you should share this picture. And I said, but this picture is a mess. No one can understand it. But then he said, why don't you make a video of you drawing the picture? And I'm like, oh, that's a good idea. And that's exactly what I did. So that's this. So this picture, these pictures are the original chicken scrawls <laughs> that, that led to, uh, to this. That's so cool.
I feel like we've been able to see behind the curtain a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there's some more questions. Yeah, yeah um, I think I see, I don't know if it's in the order in which they were asked, but I see John next and then Corin after John. Yeah. John, do you want to call for you? Yeah. Yeah, I was asking, what is your drawing tool? Because I want to download it on my laptop. I had a hard time hearing what you said. The, the tool, Henrik, that you're using? Yeah. Could you just share that again? Well, the app, app that you Yeah, means. so I can write it here. So for recording, recording and editing, ScreenFlow. And I've tried using other tools. I keep getting back to ScreenFlow. I think it's a really good tool. And no, I'm not sponsored. <laughs> and, and for drawing, it's ArtRage. And ArtRage is just a painting program. It's not made for making videos, but I use ScreenFlow to record when I'm drawing in ArtRage and that's pretty much it. And here's another tip for you, John, because I only learned this before the call when Henrik showed me on ArtRage, it by default has the cursor just as a, yeah, like a cross. And I was Googling it and I couldn't figure out how he gets the pen on there and he showed me and it's, is it the number three, Henrik? You have to press. There you go. Press three. One, two, three. three. There. And it does add so much more like to it when you see the yeah. pen rather than the little... And it changes. Now I'm using a brush, right? <laughs> so yeah, I, I love it. Even when I press the mouse, look at the tip of the brush. Do, Great. You, do you use layers or not? In... I, I use only one layer. I have one layer for the figure and then one layer for the background uh, shading and that's it. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you, John. Karen, would you like to go next? Karen, it's 1 a.m. for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be two now. <laughs> two now, all right. <laughs> it's a pleasure because I, the interesting part, when I came to Malaysia, my first engagement where the client was saying, do you know Spotify model? And I remember you always told in your, most of the time, it's a culture of the company, not, it's a, it's always great listening to you and Rick. And today also it was very nice and we picked up a lot of, because I think a, a big thing about visualization, I think that's something which really works out. My question is about, I mean, I know we agile coaches or we do training. Do you, since you talked about AI, are you using any AI tools or any of the recommendations? Of course, as you said, the agents and there will be digital agents, but is there any other tools which you, which you use to enhance the experience during the trainings or? Not so much yet. I use the tools when creating materials. I sometimes use tools for simple things like here, I need just images to illustrate different technical revolutions we've been through, or I wanted to illustrate, just show stuff. So sometimes I use just image generation sometimes, but I also still like to draw. And AI models are no good at drawing yet. But probably in the future, I expect to be able to say things like, hey, AI, here's my drawing style. And I, use, I like use, using metaphors for like this. So can you please make up a suitable metaphor for XYZ using my drawing style? And it will give me some examples and I'll get really lazy. So that's probably what's going to happen. But I also use it to iterate on content to help me figure out like what's the right level of explaining stuff. But what I am working on now is creating various forms of uh, chatbots to support my clients. So if they have some questions, they can ask my chatbot first and maybe it can help them. And if it can't, then it, it'll escalate to me and say, hey, you need to talk about, you need to talk to real Henrik about this one. Because many of the, in the world of Agile, we heard about GPTs. There are many of the people who are creating GPTs. Yeah. Do you, is, did, that, did that thought struck to you or are you also planning to create one of them? Yeah, I've experimented a little, a little bit with that. I made one called, let's see, a called Fresh Start, which I can, I'm going to pitch it right now. Uh, I can recommend it. It's, no, excuse me, let me just log in here quickly. There we go. There, Fresh Start. <laughs> I'll add a link to the chat. There we go. This is a little bot that's configured to be, in my, in my video here, I talk about how I like to take a walk with AI and just, tell it what's on my mind and it will interview me and then finally give me suggestions and then summarize what I just said. That's what Fresh Start is. Do a brain dump. It won't interrupt you. It'll just say, okay, whatever you say. And only when you ask for advice, will it give you advice. So that's a very simple little GPT that I made, but uh, I like to experimenting with this technology. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we are up to time, but side, I know you've been waiting patiently, so we'll let you have the last Let's do question. Side. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Then a philosophical question. I was just wondering when, like, I don't know, a year ago, a year and a half ago, when all these AI tools became a thing, you know, like mid journey and Dolly, you as a visual thinker, were you scared or were your thoughts when everybody so all of a sudden could create visuals with just a few clicks or without even having the skill to draw something? I, I wasn't scared. I was inspired. I, I felt that this gave me superpowers. If my job of course, my job is not making images. Images is, is a tool for me. If my job was to create and sell images, 
I would be more worried, but I would also think I need to adopt this technology. I need to embrace it and use it because hiding from it and, and trying to s stop it or saying we shouldn't do that, I think is a dangerous proposition. It's better to, as much as possible, just embrace tools. It's like if, if you're used to digging holes with a shovel and suddenly an excavator gets invented, learn to drive the excavator. That's, I think, my, my thinking around this. So learn the tools and let them give you superpowers. Just to say thanks, um, Henrik, so much for joining us. It's a really great session. Thank you. This was great. I love talking about this kind of stuff. Oh, thank you so much. Folks, should we do some jazz hands for Henrik? Thanks. Jazz hands, everybody. <laughs> and there is a LinkedIn post I put in the chat as well. If you want to continue the conversation, feel free to, to comment on that And, as and well. AI, AI does not replace visual thinking. <laughs> <It> <laughs> <will>. <laughs> there you go. It's official. <laughs> it's official. <laughs>